This episode of the EV Resource Podcast is brought to you by Titan Auto and Tire. Titan has some of the very few independent auto repair shops in Central Virginia that are qualified to work on EVs and hybrids. And from hybrids to Hummers, they fix everything. For more information and to schedule an appointment for your vehicle, go to TitanAutoTire.com. Coming up this week, Tesla discounts the Model 3 again. Volkswagen has debuted the ID Buzz Microbus for the US. The Jaguar I-Pace has been recalled for safety reasons and more. Well, hello, friends, and welcome back to the EV Resource Podcast. This is episode 154. I'm Zach Hurst, and each week I bring you the latest EV news, information, and interviews with industry experts. This week, I've got a wide range of goings on in the EV world to share with you. As always, it has been a very exciting week, and we're going to fly through these 10 news stories that I've got lined up for you. But before we get into all of that, I want to welcome a new Patreon subscriber. Let's all welcome Ethan B to the EV Resource family. Ethan has joined at the director tier, and as a result, will receive a number of benefits for that position. In addition to having his name included in the podcast show notes and read aloud each week, he will also receive ad-free episodes of the podcast posted directly to the Patreon page and access to the monthly Zoom hangout I call the Water Cooler Chat. He will receive a new EV resource branded coffee mug and a t-shirt that says keep calm and drive electric. And maybe most importantly, he now has the ability to influence the content and the direction of EV resource as a whole. So everybody make some room for Ethan, scoot on over. And if anything that I mentioned in terms of the benefits that he will be receiving at the director tier, if any of that sounds like it would be interesting and something you'd like to, then I'd encourage you to go to the Patreon page, look at the different tiers and see maybe if there's something that would be a good fit for you. So without further ado, let's get right into the news. First up is a story about the Tesla Model 3. Tesla is doubling down on discounts for the Model 3, positioning it with the full $7,500 tax credit as one of the least expensive EVs in the US. And this comes off the heels of discounts already last month. Factoring in the full federal tax credit of $7,500, the price for the base model Model 3 now comes in at $30,000 in some markets and potentially lower if you include state rebates, some as much as an additional $5,000, which we will get to here in just a minute. By far, this is absolutely one of the best deals in the EV space right now. And it's interesting because even the base Model 3, the one with the LFP batteries, now qualifies for the full tax credit. Previously, it had only qualified for half because it's assembled here in North America, but the LFP batteries were sourced from China. So to me, this can only mean that either Tesla has found a loophole in the new law or they are sourcing the LFP batteries from somewhere other than China. The rear wheel drive Model 3 is the only vehicle that uses those LFP batteries. Of course, any additional savings as a result of the federal tax credit assumes that the buyer even has that much of a taxable burden. There are a lot of people out there that do, but it's important to keep in mind that half the people in the U.S. don't pay any federal income tax. So that means that more than half of the people in this country couldn't even take advantage of that. The rear wheel drive Model 3 starts now at $40,240 for new orders and some of the existing inventory as low as $37,830 which is not bad, not bad at all. And if you happen to live in Colorado and are in the market for an EV, you're about to have a big smile on your face. Colorado will soon become the state with the most generous EV tax credits in the entire country. Starting July 1st of this year, the Colorado EV tax credit increases from a current $2,000 to $5,000 for vehicles with a starting MSRP lower than $80,000. This is a significant <laughs> increase that translates into total potential tax credits of the $5,000 plus the $7,500 federal of $12,500, assuming that the customer, of course, qualifies for both. The Colorado legislature passed several bills earlier this month that are designed to help accelerate the adoption of cleaner transportation, complementing the Inflation Reduction Act and American Recovery Act, to incentivize customers to buy new electric vehicles and also home appliances. Governor Jared Polis signed HB 23-1272, tax policy that advances decarbonization, 
which not only increases and extends the state EV tax credit for passenger cars, but also for electric, medium and heavy duty trucks. And there's more. Beginning January 1st of next year, 2024, the new bill also establishes an additional tax credit of $2,500 for EVs with an MSRP under $35,000. This means that Colorado residents who buy an EV that costs under $35,000 will get access to, assuming they qualify, the $5,000 state EV tax credit, the additional $2,500 on top of that, and potentially the $7,500 tax credit for a grand total of $15,000 in credits off the price of the vehicle. That means the Tesla Model 3, if they were able to get it down below $35,000, that means that that car would then cost $20,000 brand new, which would be pretty great if Tesla was able to do that. But honestly, even if they don't, you still have $12,500 off the price of the car And there are other EVs out there that do fall lower than that $35,000 price range that would qualify, provided that the owners did. Next, China's BYD has set a new sales record. Last month, the Chinese market leader led the rising momentum with battery electric passenger vehicle sales rising 124% year over year to 119,603 units in May alone, according to data from CNEV Post. BYD typically reports new energy vehicle sales, which include not only battery electric vehicles, but also plug-in hybrids as well. And for new energy vehicles total, the company sold 240,220 units in May, breaking its previous monthly record set in December of 235,200. The BYD Dolphin specifically saw sales rise 377% year over year to 30,679, based most likely on higher demand from the dropping prices. So I'm glad to see that the Chinese EV market is coming back slightly after some legitimate concerns over demand. But at this point, it looks like demand is still going strong. Toyota is throwing even more money at their plans to build EVs here in North America. Toyota said last Wednesday it will invest an additional $2.1 billion in its new battery plant in North Carolina as the automaker deepens its efforts to tap a rising demand for EVs here. Toyota's latest investment in the battery plant brings the total to $5.9 billion. The facility, its planned hub for developing and producing lithium ion batteries, will have six battery production lines, four for hybrid electric vehicles and two for full battery electric vehicles. Seeking to solidify its foothold in the EV sector, Toyota has said it will introduce 10 new battery powered vehicles targeting sales of one and a half million EVs a year by 2026. The automaker also said its first U.S.-made battery electric sports utility vehicle will be assembled at the company's Kentucky plant from 2025 and will be a three-row SUV. Personally, I can't wait to see what they produce, as long as it's better than the BZ4X, which honestly should be fairly easy to achieve. It doesn't set a very high bar. Toyota can absolutely do much better. Next, the bus is back. Yes, the VW microbus that is or almost back. We won't see them actually hitting showrooms until next year. But this week, we got a look at all the juicy details. So I'm going to go through the specs and features in a few bullet points very quickly here. The US version of the ID Buzz is going to be a three row long wheelbase model with increased cargo and passenger space. It's going to have power sliding doors and a power lift gate, which All of it can be operated by waving your foot underneath the vehicle. It's going to utilize a 91 kilowatt hour battery pack and a rear electric motor generating 282 horsepower and 406 pound feet of torque. But at launch, there's also going to be a dual motor all wheel drive variant with around 330 horsepower. It's going to be offered with two different seating configurations, a standard three person bench for the second row, providing seven seats in total or optionally captain's chairs, and that would then be a six-seater. The second and third rows will be able to fold down to create a flat surface with an optional removable cargo shelf for extra storage. The seats can also be adjusted for easier third row access. It's going to have a 12.9-inch center touchscreen infotainment system, which is going to be improved over the European ID Buzz, 
And it's also going to have eight USB ports all around the cabin for various seating positions with ventilation from the AC system at various positions, something that the European model also did not have. Standard features are going to include 12-way power front seats with heat, ventilation, and massage functions standard. Keyless entry, which is kind of standard on every vehicle now. Automatic climate control, level 2 highway assistance. And then optional features are going to be a 14-speaker Harman Kardon audio system and a 360-degree camera. Heated windshield, heated washer nozzles, heated steering wheel, second row outboard seats are also going to be heated Additionally, the ID Buzz has a removable center console and features movable dividers that double as a bottle opener and ice scraper. So pretty cool. It's going to be very, very well equipped. Pricing has not exactly been released, and they haven't actually said an official release date other than that it's expected to go on sale next year. What I've seen in terms of pricing for speculation is it's going to start around $70,000 or so. But honestly, with all of the tech and features packed into this vehicle, they could probably sell it for a hundred grand and still sell every single one of them. The downside, the bigger downside maybe in terms of price is it will not be built here in the US. Volkswagen has said they could build it here, but they're not going to. So it will not be eligible for the US tax credit. Next, after stumbling along for a number of years now, EV startup Faraday Future has officially launched their limited edition FF91 electric SUV featuring numerous advanced AI systems for $309,000. The company said the model is going to be limited to 300 units globally and that it has opened reservations for both US and China. According to the company's website, the FF91 will have a 130 kilowatt hour battery that provides an estimated, uh, and I did the math on this one, 2.9 miles per kilowatt hour efficiency, which is okay. It's not great, and but it's not horrible either. Peak power is rated at 1,050 horsepower, and the company says that the FF91 will accelerate from 0 to 60 in 2.27 seconds, and they also mentioned that the force of acceleration is greater than gravity at 1.1 G's. So they are saying that it out accelerates gravity, which while being technically true, I think is kind of a silly thing to say. Charging specs are not shared, but the company says the FF91 can charge at a max rate of 500 miles of range per hour. So if we do the math, that should be close to a peak charge rate of 172 kilowatts. Also not the best out there, but at 172 kilowatts, that's definitely far from the worst as well. For the sake of the 300 potential customers of this vehicle, I do hope that the company has put its most troubled times behind them, but I'm not going to hold my breath. And Jaguar has some worrisome news for owners of the I-Pace. On May 30, Jaguar issued a safety recall report with NHTSA, the National Highway Transit Safety Administration or whatever it is, um, NHTSA, for a voluntary recall of 6,367 I-Pace vehicles from model years 2019 through 2024 that were built at its Graz vehicle assembly plant in Graz, Austria. The report said I-Pace vehicles have experienced thermal overload of the vehicle's high voltage battery pack assembly that was made by LG Energy Solution Company that causes smoke or fire underneath the vehicle. It said that the defect could result in an increased risk of injury to occupants or persons outside the vehicle, as well as property damage. Recalled vehicles will receive an update to the battery energy control module software that will monitor the battery pack assembly operational status that indicates where the battery contains conditions that might lead to thermal overload condition, the report said. The software provides an enhanced level of driver warnings in relation to battery condition where the software determines a risk exists. The high voltage battery charging capacity is going to be limited to 75%. The warning message and associated owner guide and instruction directs the driver to take their vehicle to a Jaguar retailer for diagnosis and as required repair. It seems like their response to this is very similar to what Chevy did for the Bolt EV for basically a similar issue. So now we have another vehicle added to the LG recall battery cell list that off the top of my head, as I'm thinking about it, of course, the Chevy Bolt EV and EUV were affected. The Hyundai Kona, Kia Nero, 
the Chrysler Pacifica plug-in hybrid. Uh, I think that's it. Well, and of course, yeah, now the Jaguar I-Pace. I don't think I missed any, but that is very concerning. And if I had a vehicle that the battery pack was assembled by LG or sourced LG cells, I would definitely be a little cautious about how I charged and treated that battery pack. Hey guys, it's Matt Clausen, your host of the All Automotive Podcast. I've been in the automotive industry for over 30 years. I've owned my own repair shop for the last 15 years. I was going to write a book, but I started this podcast instead. So come join me for my take on vehicle extended service contracts or what to look for when purchasing a used vehicle. Like and subscribe to the All Automotive Podcast. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening now. Okay, if you've been listening to the podcast recently, over the past few months, I've really started to develop an irritation with talking about EV range. And if you've been a keen listener, I haven't actually mentioned range at all for any of the EVs I've talked about yet in this episode. Not the Model 3, the ID Buzz, the FF91, none of them. And I've explained previously why I think talking about range is a mistake and actually prohibits and slows down the adoption of electric vehicles. And this next story is a great example of why talking about range is absolutely 100% dumb. Motor Trend on June 2nd published an article with the title, All New Fisker Ocean EV SUV Beats Tesla Model Y EPA Range. And a subtitle that says, Despite a bumpy start, the work put into Henrik Fisker's electric SUV appears to have paid off. Okay, so if you don't read any further... And sadly, lots of people don't read past the headlines. If you don't read any further, you might think, based on that, that the Fisker Ocean is a better vehicle than the Tesla Model Y. After all, range is the only thing that matters, right? Well, you know my answer. (laughs) Wrong. Very wrong. You see, the Fisker Ocean is equipped with a 113 kilowatt hour battery pack, of which 106 and a half kilowatt hours is usable. And the EPA rated range is, gasp, I'm mentioning it, 360 miles when you have the 20-inch wheels on the vehicle. So doing the math there, it returns a 3.38 miles per kilowatt hour efficiency on combined city and highway EPA test cycles. For the Model Y, it uses an estimated 81 kilowatt hour battery pack, so significantly smaller, and returns an EPA estimated range of 330 miles. So doing the math there, that means it achieves basically a four mile per kilowatt hour efficiency or for Tesla owners that use watt hours per mile, that would be 250 watt hours per mile. So which is the better vehicle? Well, if you listen to Motor Trend, it would seem that the Fisker Ocean is going to be the better bet. But anybody can cram a bigger battery into an EV and get more range and apparently more headlines. But I think celebrating that is like celebrating the SUV that has a bigger gas tank than its competitor, which I'm sure that you agree with me. That's just outright dumb. And all of this isn't to take anything away from the Fisker Ocean. I'm sure that it's amazing. And honestly, I would absolutely love to test one. But focusing on the range is misleading because there are so many factors that influence real world range And most people are probably never going to take their vehicle from full all the way down to empty anyway. Next, let's talk about something else that most people will never do. And maybe I'm a hypocrite for getting into this because I don't want to talk about range. But I also want to talk about other things that are probably equally as dumb. But but I'm going to talk about it because I think it's exciting. And I like this a lot more. Let's talk about speed. Specifically, record EV lap times at Germany's Nürburgring. Anybody who has been paying attention to the lap records and the battle between Porsche and Tesla have noticed that for the past few years, both companies have been taking turns as EV king of the ring. Well, now Tesla has dethroned the Germans once again with a Model S Plaid that has been equipped with the recent track package. Previously, Porsche had set a time around the almost 13 mile long track of only 7 minutes 33 seconds in a Taycan that had been modified somewhat. And that's a very respectable time putting the Taycan Turbo S 
in a group with the Honda NSX, Nissan GTR, Audi R8 V10, McLaren MP4 12C, and a number of others. But now, the updated Model S Plaid has chopped 8 seconds off the previous EV record with a time of 7 minutes and 25 seconds. Naturally, as you might imagine, this announcement has led to sales of the $15,000 to $20,000 track package for the Model S Plaid selling out and currently, as of yesterday when I checked it, it's listed as out of stock on Tesla's website. The track package upgrades the braking system, which is very needed. If you haven't heard my braking episode from when I was talking with uh, the guys from NRS Brakes, we mentioned the Plaid and specifically how it's just not <laughs> very good with the stock steel brakes, but it upgrades the braking system with carbon ceramic rotors, upgrades the calipers, steel brake lines, a new brake fluid, which is upgraded, very much needed. But then the track package also includes wheels and tires, tires that can handle the top speed now, which has been unlocked, of 200 miles an hour. If anybody has a Model S, let me just put this out there, a Model S Plaid with the track package, and you are going to want to be anywhere close to Central Virginia, I am absolutely more than happy to test it at the racetrack. Um, I don't think there's enough room for the to full top speed of 200, but, you know, it doesn't hurt to try, right? <laughs> okay, and lastly for the news segment, I want to touch on the Hyundai Vision N concept, the well, Vision N74 concept, actually, and it seems that this is an idea that will not die, which I'm excited about because it's definitely one of the wildest concepts from an automaker in the recent years. It was originally inspired by the Hyundai Pony Coupe concept, the hydrogen powered sports wedge, if you will, that looks like a Group 5 racer sprung from a William Gibson novel. It encapsulates perfectly the 1980s aesthetics design mixed with a futuristic edge. The only problem is Hyundai wouldn't build this or they will. It's kind of been on again, off again, but now it seems like it's back on again. Hyundai's chief creative officer, when asked by Top Gear whether it would be built, the CCO replied, absolutely, before adding, we are serious about this. This could come into production. We have the platform. It's a motorsport platform, end quote. So I hope they do make a mass market production version of the concept. And honestly, I don't care what powers it as long as it's electric and can refuel by plugging into an EV charger. Okay, so that is it for the news segment, but I've got a lot more to cover, including some awesome answers and involvement with the question of the week. So don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Do you own a business and want to reach EV owners and people interested in electric vehicles? EV Resource is welcoming businesses nationwide, both big and small, to become advertising partners with us across all platforms. The EV Resource podcast, magazine, YouTube videos, social media, and our webpage. For more information, please email Zach at hello at ev-resource.com. Now it is time for the question of the week. And if you remember, this week is going to review actually two questions from the prior episodes. So maybe the questions of the week in this case. For podcast episode 151, I had asked if there was one thing that you could do or change about the current progress being made to EV adoption that would speed up the process, what would it be and why? And I forgot to post it, so then I revisited that and reintroduced that, if you will, on episode 152. So Rajiv Narayan said, quote, improve the availability and reliability of intercity DC fast charging, end quote. And Charles Hall added, quote, have all manufacturers settle on the Tesla NACS that would instantly reduce everybody's range anxiety. Electrify America has had years to improve, but hasn't, end quote. Andy Cooper added, quote, aside from the obvious level three charging situation, I'd love to see a nationwide effort to make level two more commonplace, like at the office, side streets and at apartment and condo complexes. It should include accompanying laws that would prevent HOAs from blocking or placing unreasonable burden on charger installations, end quote. And before getting to the other comments, I want to respond to these three. I agree that charging is the biggest hurdle to mass adoption of EVs. While the public DC fast charging network is expanding, we still have a long way to go. And to your points, the existing infrastructure is fraught with reliability issues. 
the lack of reliable options erodes consumer confidence and prohibits adoption of EVs. Range anxiety isn't a thing, really, but charging anxiety absolutely is, and we must have charging infrastructure that can fill up EV batteries in the time that people need. To Andy's point, most of the time, people really don't need to use a fast charger. Level 2 would be just fine, and I agree, we need them everywhere. Personally, I think any place that an EV is going to sit for more than an hour, it should be plugged into a level two charger, especially for people who cannot charge overnight at home. We just need more of them. And taking a different direction, John Hurst said, quote, I'm not worried about charging. Consumers will end up providing enough pressure to fix all of that. What consumers don't have control over is battery technology. I'd like to see more sustainable batteries. I'd like them to have a higher energy density so they can be lighter and used in smaller vehicles, end quote. And sustainable batteries, I did follow up with John to ask, mean ones that don't use rare earth minerals where it doesn't take a whole lot of carbon to extract the minerals from the ground. Chris Lawrence responded, quote, I would like to see more conversation about emergency situations. Once you evacuate, then where do you charge if you were originally charging at home, end quote. Well, I think in this case, people would need to charge wherever they ended up. I know that's an easy answer, but once again, we need charging wherever an EV sits for more than an hour. I'm okay with even 110, level one charging, just something there. And then to the second question, which was the question for episode 152, what is the best way for EV owners and drivers to pay their fair share of road use? And I'll actually start with a comment on the YouTube video from Ronald Garrison. He said, quote, annually checked mileage multiplied by wheelbase for all vehicles, whatever the means of propulsion, end quote. And Andy Cooper said, quote, I read somewhere to have it based on weight of vehicle. That one seemed interesting to me, end quote. John Hurst said, quote, I agree that mileage and weight would be the most fair. Really, it'd make the most sense to ditch the gas tax altogether and tax tires instead. If you tax performance tires or larger tires, though, there might be a safety issue in people choosing to buy tires that are taxed less. I don't like the idea of inspections because for cars that are newer and that have less potential for safety problems, inspections are a waste of time for the consumer and a waste of tax money. Registration fees would likely not be enough to cover infrastructure improvements. If we want to encourage the adoption of EVs, I don't like the idea of taxing electricity, end quote. And so on this, I think I've made my opinion fairly known, but I do think that we should have a standard fee structure regardless of the fuel type. You know, gas, diesel, hydrogen, electricity, propane, natural gas, whatever. We should check mileage annually, either through inspections, a device that would maybe get placed in the vehicle like uh, some of the insurance companies have provided for their customers, or a direct digital connection to the car that can extract the odometer reading. Of those three ideas, I like the idea of just a quick mileage inspection once a year at approved locations. Doesn't need to check for anything other than the odometer reading. For states that already have vehicle safety inspections, this would be really easy as they have to record the mileage as a part of that process. And then you take the amount of miles driven and maybe apply a multiplier based on vehicle weight. As an example, vehicles that are 3,000 pounds or less would pay a 1x multiplier, but vehicles 6,000 pounds would pay a 2x multiple. And it doesn't need to be linear like that, but you get kind of where I'm going with that. Heavier vehicles would pay more. Vehicles that drive more miles would pay more. Somebody that drives a very lightweight vehicle, maybe 10 miles a day, would pay very little. Naturally, regardless of the proposed ideas from anybody, once politicians get their hands on this, I think there's going to be lots of exemptions for corporate fleets and other friends of the state or uh <laughs> corporations that might support their re-election campaigns, etc. Um, but I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole either. So thank you to all the answers for both questions. I love the thoughts and comments. And honestly, I cannot wait to hear what you think about this week's question of the week. And for this week, I want to know what was the main reason that you bought an EV or what is the main motivation for wanting to buy an EV if you haven't bought one yet? 
Was it to save money? Was it for environmental reasons? Was it for performance? Or was it something else? As always, I'll have the poll pinned to the top of the EV Resource Patreon page. You do not have to be a current Patreon supporter to participate. So please, I invite your, your comments and thoughts. On then to the EV Resource Hotline segment, which I am still not giving up yet. This is your chance to be featured on the podcast. All you have to do is call and leave me your EV question, comment, or discussion topic. The best, easiest way to do this is to use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record your message, and then email that file to me at hello at ev-resource.com. And the reason I said I'm not giving up is because, again, I don't have any submissions for this. So I'd actually like some feedback on this particular segment. It would appear that maybe it needs to be changed somehow. I don't know. So let me know what you think about it. Do you want me to keep this as a part of the show or do you think that I should scrap it? I love the idea, but this show is not about me. It's about you and what you want and what you want to hear. So let me know, should I keep the EV resource hotline in? And if so, then I would definitely uh, encourage you guys to participate with that. Or because there hasn't been any participation, does that mean that you don't want it and I should just scrap it? Let me know. I do have a book recommendation before I get to the final announcements. This one is for anyone curious about GM's CEO, Mary Barra, and her quest to transform GM into an electric car maker. The book is called Charging Ahead, General Motors, Mary Barra, and the Reinvention of an American Icon, and it is available in the EV Resource shop. You can get the book almost anywhere, of course, but I humbly ask that you use the referral link that's in the shop for the Amazon uh, product page because I get a small kickback from Amazon for the referral. So naturally, that's something that I would I would ask that maybe you consider that. I'll also put the link in the show notes so you make it easy. You can just click on that. I have this book and I enjoyed reading it and it was very enlightening and I learned a lot about Mary Barra and kind of some of the inner workings and, and background and history there that you probably haven't heard. So it's pretty cool. Moving on then, I want to thank our growing Patreon family for their generous contributions. At the director tier, we have Rajiv Narayan, Andy Cooper, and as I mentioned at the top of the show, now Ethan B. At the executive producer tier, Chris Lawrence, and at the producer tier, Charles Hall, Eric Weber, and Alan Michael. So thank you to all of the Patreon members, even those that don't get their names read out. I am genuinely grateful for your support. It means a lot. Instead of mandatory membership fees or paywalls to fund EV resource and support all of this, I, in addition to Patreon, use advertising and affiliate connections to keep this free for all of you. It, it will always be free. I'm never going to <laughs> never going to put this content behind a paywall. But in exchange for that, I encourage you to consider supporting the organizations that support EV resource. I have a full listing of all of them on the web page under the sponsors tab, but the direct link is ev-resource.com slash deals. There are a number of deals, discount codes, and otherwise that are listed. So if you are in the market for some of those items, services, or products anyway, then definitely check that out and maybe you can help them, which they will help me. And then we can have EV resource continue on um, uh, let's see okay so that would be it for things for this week so thank you so much for joining me and I will catch you next time <laughs>